Okay. Very nice, everyone. So we will be getting started again, everyone. My name is Holly Phelps, and I am your Tableau account executive here in the Pacific Northwest. I am based out of Seattle, Washington, and we, yes, have been having crazy weather here. Sometimes it'll be sunny, sometimes it will be hailing and pouring rain. So it's been a, it's been a crazy couple of days, but thank you all so much for joining today's meeting. We've got a jam-packed agenda. Couple uh, logistics. Uh, we are all gonna be on mute and uh, we'll be monitoring the chat. So please post your questions in the chat. After each session, we will review the chats. We'll uh, carve out a couple of minutes and we'll review the chat for questions and we'll be able to answer that for you. Also too, if there's anyone out there that is interested in participating in the TUG group, um, we are building out a committee. Um, on the call today, we have Micah Brown and Stephanie Henry, who will be leading up that committee. Um, it's just a great opportunity for you to network. It's a great opportunity for you to give your input on what you would like to see in future user groups. Uh, so if you are interested, um, please reach out to me at hphelps at salesforce.com and I will connect you uh, with the team. So with that, um, there's also, this is going to be recorded uh, for today's session and will be posted on our TUG user group uh, YouTube. So hopefully everyone is good with that. If you're not, uh, you know, please feel free to drop off. But with that, I am going to turn this over to our first uh, two guest speakers from Lane County. We have got Micah Brown and we have got Mo Young. So with that, thank you everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Holly, for uh, introducing us. Um, I'm going to share my screen in just a second. I just wanted to share that I do have my colleague, Mo Young. I'm super excited about this. She's um, been a huge part of the presentation that you're about to see. So if I'm going to do that thing that everyone talks about, <laughs> here we go. Um, you should be able to see my PowerPoint now. Yes, okay. we can see your PowerPoint. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so we are gonna talk to you today about the art of storytelling. And in particular, we had some really cool uh, ways to uh, involve the community in that storytelling with data. And this is specifically around DEI data. Oops, get the one here. All right, so we're just gonna tell you a little bit about Lane County and Health and Human Services. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Mo, who is going to introduce uh, some of the historical context and some of our what we produced on the BIPOC timeline. Actually, I happen to know that the person who helped create that is online. Melanie, you did awesome. A lot of this work um, was uh, done with her before she moved up to the state. And we're going to talk about the Lane County Equity Lens, uh, applying the equity lens to our vaccine delivery, and then how we use that in sort of real-time decision making. And we'll have questions at the end. So quick, most people, it sounds like, are from Oregon. Many people are anyway. But uh, Lane County is about 379,000 people, depending on which census you look at. Um, almost the size of the state of Connecticut, but about one-tenth of the population density. We go from the coast to Hasita Head there, um, all the way to the Cascade Mountains. And if you lived in Eugene at any time, you know that we're pretty rabid duck fans down here. So um, health and human services is the largest department within Lane County. Uh, we have about 900 employees and that's spread across eight divisions. Uh, five of them are external. So we have our public health department, our human services department, community health centers, behavioral health, developmental disabilities. And then we have our internal facing divisions, our clinical financial services, administration, and the division I actually represent is in quality and compliance. Um, it's a very diverse uh, body of work since we are doing everything, like I said, from the public health realm into our primary care clinics and you know housing and homelessness and and addressing those things. Our behavioral health division works a lot with people in the intersection between the justice system and behavioral health and then developmental disabilities. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mo, who's gonna give us some more of the historical context of Lane County. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Mo Young. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm the Community Partnerships uh, Program Supervisor here at Lane County. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and to be able to contribute to this conversation, seeing as I, I am not a Tableau user. I am a Tableau fan, and I'm a fan of those of you who know how to use this tool. Um, so, so this is probably not new information to most of you, or maybe even any of you, but it's important for us to um, just continue to remind ourselves. Um, from time immemorial, indigenous people lived in what is now called Oregon. From the 1830s to 1900, um, white settlers, colonists, claim Oregon as a US territory, and they made policies to steal land from indigenous peoples, and also to exclude black people from settling. Um, in the land. In 1849, federally appointed Governor Joseph Lane arrived to proclaim that Oregon um, is a territory of the United States. He was raised in North Carolina and held pro-slavery beliefs. He also is the man who Lane County is named after. Um, in 1850, the Oregon Donation Land Act is passed and the stealing of land becomes policy. In the 20s, in the 1920s, the KKK comes to Oregon and Eugene is one of the places where um, they are, it's a, like a seat of the Klan. In the 1940s, Eugene's first African-American neighborhood took root on a riverbank north of the city outside city limits. And in 1949, Lane County officials demolished their homes and church and forced them to relocate. In 1954, the federal government recognizes just a handful of the existing tribes in Oregon. So we have nine federally recognized tribes out of the many, many, many more that lived here before white folks showed up. Um, and in 2002, uh, approved by a vote of 71 to 29, so 29 people were against this, um, our state finally removed exclusionary language from the constitution. <laughs> so. Um, that language was still legal until 20 years ago. Um, next slide. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about this timeline that, um, that we created with Melanie Spenru, who's here on this call. Um, she is a Tableau wizard and we could not have done this without her. Um, So on Lane County's equity and access webpage, you'll see Lane County history as an option. So you go to lanecounty.org, you go to the equity and access webpage, choose Lane County history. And when you click on that link, you'll see an option to open a timeline or a map. Um, the timeline is an interactive tool where people can look um, to select different dates to see what happened on each date. And so the next just kind of handful of slides are examples of what the timeline will look like if you go to the website. Um, and the map works essentially the same way as the timeline, except for people are choosing locations on the map and not, um, not years. Well, let's see, I think the next slide after this is, yeah, so the only thing that we're sure of is that we don't know everything that happened in Lane County. So um, Melanie had this cool idea to create this form that people can fill out to submit additions to the timeline. And so if you know that something happened within the you know geographical limits of Lane County and you don't see it on our timeline, you can go to this um, submission form and, and fill it out as you know thoroughly as you can. Once a submission is made, we work to verify it. So that could be in partnership with the Lane Historical Society or other local partners, the U of O. Um, and once it's been verified, we'll update the timeline. And so we really have an opportunity to do this in partnership with community, um, which, is, which is super exciting. I'm gonna pass it off to Micah, I believe. Yep, I'll, I'll go ahead and pick it up. Great segue to our next topic. But I did want to say how exciting this is to have community involvement, because as most mentioned, uh, the only thing we really know is that we don't know everything. And so many of these stories of the people that lived in our community, either in the past or currently, um, 
just go unrecognized in history. And I know it was it was actually super fascinating for me to take a look at this the first time as Melanie and Mo were making it and recognizing like, man, I did not know so much of what had gone on in Lane County for so long. So I, I hope that we can get continue to get more submissions to this and find out more of that story as a history nerd myself. Um, it's just, it, I love this stuff and it really helps gives that context. So we're gonna move on. So this is how um, it was built by Melanie, who I honestly, Melanie, um, I, had, I had to take a lot of time to take a look and figure out how you did this. This is pretty masterful. So she actually was able to pull in um, several different uh, data sources in order to make that timeline. Um, I still have to unwind a little bit how she managed all of that because I have to do an update for Mo here in a little bit, but um, it was a great piece of work. And so things like that are possible. I, again, uh, we and our team didn't even know that we could do that before Melanie uh, gave it a shot, but it is all built in Tableau with a couple of different data sources to help figure out where the timeline is and then also where the images are that you saw in the previous slides. So that also led, or actually, Mo, was that before or after the equity lens? All of the time is just yeah. The, same. the last few years has been hard to keep track. Yeah. So one of the things that was developed by uh, some, well, Mo and her leadership was the equity lens to apply at Lane County, and this is. Um, but, and I'll let Mo finish out the explanation as we say going into it. This is a, a way for us to ask the right questions as we're doing our work and um, help us understand how the decisions we make impact different um, parts of our community. So Mo, do you wanna add some more context to that? Yeah, so we, um, a bunch of folks who worked in different departments across the county created this equity lens tool. Um, that you see over the course of, I would say a year. Um, we looked at, you know, who, who has an equity lens and how, and did it seem like something that could work here at Lane County? And then also how might we tweak it in order to make it better? And so one of the, one of the things that you'll see is we've got this, um, this sort of short version, which we'll go over a little bit more in depth in a minute. Um, we also have created a Cognito form where people can fill it out online. So if I go to fill out an equity lens about a decision that I'm making and I put my email address in, I actually get a link that I can go update it, edit it, change it. Um, because one thing that we know about um, equity work is it's, it's a living thing. It's ever changing. Um, as soon as you think you got it right, you did not get it right. It's something has shifted. Um, Let's see, next slide. So I just wanted to sort of walk through some of our answers. And we actually have one of the folks who came up with these answers um, on the call, Jennifer Webster. We looked at um, applying the equity lens to vaccine distribution. Now this was back when, you know, we had our age categories and um, it wasn't open to everyone. So think back to the very beginning of when the vaccine was available. So we looked at our purpose, right? So what are we trying to do? What is our goal? We were we decided that we were trying to ensure that the people that were most impacted by COVID death and disease would have access to the vaccine as quickly as possible. Um, we were looking to address the disproportionality of vaccine distribution in populations that were the most impacted. Um, and the reason that we knew there was disproportionality is because of the data that Micah and his team were collecting. Um, when we thought about inclusion and who would be impacted and are they being included in the process, we thought, okay, well, in our county, the people most, which is not, you know, in our county, same as probably every county that you all live in, the folks that were most impacted by COVID were people of color, um, Latinx people, homeless folks, older folks with lower technological staffiness. And then we also decided that our work with community-based organizations could help to address that. Right, but we didn't really know how. Sorry. Um, sorry. So we looked at um, outcomes. How might this decision increase, decrease, or ignore equity? 
we thought, well, it could provide more access to vaccine for populations most impacted. We could increase accessibility to appointments appointments by making them available after hours, available to those without internet access or otherwise. Um, and then we thought, okay, if we do all of that, how might we communicate it? And again, we, we reached out to our community-based organizations as partners. Um, the way that we evaluated it, so how will we know if we have accomplished our goal is we looked at the data again. Um, so all of this sort of created an opportunity for us to create codes or for Micah's team to create codes that we then provided to our community-based partners. And those were either CBOs or individuals who were just very connected um, where they could sort of go through, they could go through the back door to get people um, vaccinated, the people that they serve vaccinated. <clears throat> because what we were seeing is we would open the vaccine, you know, registration at, I don't know, 9 a.m. and by 9.15 it was full. So if you didn't have a computer or you were at work, you were just out of luck until next week when you would try. Um, I think that's my whole part and then you get to talk, Micah. Okay. Yeah, so when we were doing this work, and I, I gotta say, I just want to set it up for a minute later here when we're talking about it. This was actually super exciting because it was maybe one of the first times we connected all the dots on being able to get data in making sort of real time decisions about how we were presenting uh, new vaccine um, slots, as well as how we were addressing these disparities. Um, but we encountered a lot of uh, challenges around that. So one of the biggest ones is difficulty knowing even who was really living in our community. What did those communities of color look like? Uh, how many uh, folks, you know, sort of identified as that? Um, there's lots of different sources. They all seem to have different ways of uh, measuring th these things. So it was it was kind of a struggle. Um, we asked for contributions from the community. Um, answering questions about themselves and even the CBOs about the communities they particularly served. And, you know, recognizing, and Mo and I had this conversation so many times, um, that every time we ask a question, um, we're actually kind of reducing the number of people who are participating, whether that's intentional or not. And um, so we were really careful about, you know, people sharing um, details about themselves and what that might look like. But ultimately, all of this work ended up allowing us to tell a different story. And so a couple of the things that we looked at, as Mo alluded to, we looked at how people were signing up, what times of day did they seem to sign up. And we started seeing some, some gaps. Um, some people who were very connected, who were up, you know, first thing in the morning, hit refresh on the scheduling, um, they were able to get um, their schedules, but uh, some of the folks that were struggling with um, technology or maybe work during the day were not able to. So that was reflected kind of in our early March numbers. And what we did is we started adding these CBO codes. So what this was is a way that we could kind of reserve some, and we eventually opened them up if they weren't full, but uh, reserve some for some more targeted outreach. So um, actually one of the cooler ones was out in Florence, um, the local library uh, volunteer group got together and helped some of our elder population um, get vaccinated. And so we set aside some for them so that they could work through that process during the day. Uh, but we also had some, some gaps that we were starting to see um, in, I think maybe one of the bigger ones was around the native uh, Hawaiian and Pacific Islander race category. We just were not seeing any folks getting signed up. 0.82% of our vaccines were going to them um, at Autzen Stadium, for instance, and 0.88. So one of the things that we early on did is uh, worked with one of the CBOs that served the Pacific Islander group, and we got them those codes. And you can see that with a code, um, they were going up now to 2.5% or 3% of our vaccines being given. And the same down here at a uh, Lane Event Center, it went up pretty dramatically. And now, Mo, I can't remember what you, you quoted a number of how many folks in that community have been vaccinated so far. We're at like 94%. Yeah. It's really 
when when we had started in March, it was like less than 10% of that population had been. So it was a really different story at the end. And that was um, through a lot of these other uh, organizations, uh, Central Latino um, in the community, man, they had the best vaccine events. Um, <laughs> There was always like a burrito truck and and music and kind of a celebration. And um, so they had some really great turnout as well for their CPO codes. We also did some work around geography. So again, we had some very um, intense people in South Eugene who were taking the vaccines meant for the Mackenzie River uh, fire victims and they were driving up there. So we had to do some work to try to help that out. And yeah, so I think this actually might be the last slide. So that's the end of our story. Good timing, Mo, we did it. <laughs> we, were, we were worried that we had too much um, content. Do you wanna add anything before we, we finish up, Mo? No, I don't think so. We've been having a riveting conversation in the chat um, about the Equity Lens tool and getting community input. And I, we could talk for hours about that, so. Um, and I'm happy to another time. Yeah, do you, does anyone have any questions they uh, directly for us? We have about eight minutes, it looks like. So. Let's see, was the submission form in the dashboard uh, web link, embedded web link? Yes. What are CBOs? Thank you, Darcy. Um, <laughs> Darcy's in our human resources department here at Lane County. CBOs are community-based organizations and they tend to have a much more direct connection with the communities that they work with than um, we might at public health. So they were just instrumental. And Mo, there was also some other groups besides CBOs, tr sort of traditional CBOs, like you had the Black Elders uh, sort of initiative that you did. Yeah, and we also, I mean, you brought up the the Native Hawaiian um, population, and and there's there's a woman in town who's just amazing. Her name is Auntie Chris or Chris Galago, um, and she single handedly is is why we are doing so much um, work with that community. So she's not a CBO; she's actually a teacher and a volunteer. Um, but she is connected widely to that community. Hi, Erica. Are we planning on writing up these efforts for dissemination? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> we just, maybe we, um, Erica and I are connected on social media. So she knows I just presented on this um, sort of, not the data piece, um, necessarily, not the how to build the data piece, but we just presented at the um, National Preparedness Conference last week in Atlanta um, on this. But yeah, I think that'd be great if we did a report on, on this later this year, more to come. Was the historical piece at the beginning our land acknowledgement statement? No, that was, I mean, that was because I think it's important that we do that, but I don't know that, um, I don't know that, d does this meeting do a land acknowledgement generally? I don't think so. I haven't, I haven't encountered that before, so. I always think it's important to put the, put the work that you're doing in context with the, with the history of the place that you're doing it because the way we show up to do our work really varies based on what has happened. Those are both yeah. for you, my friend. <laughs> um, well, I, I would say, um, well, I, I can't speak to the technical part. As I mentioned before, uh, Melanie did a great job of building our um, uh, BIPOC timeline, but I would say the biggest lessons we learned is we really have to do better at understanding our communities. And it's not necessarily a, a technical condition. I've, I've encountered it in so many different places, but um, it's just really hard. And there's a, a lack of sort of um, 
for a lack of a better term, governance over how we measure these different communities and how we can uh, have a common language around them. So because of that, there was actually several times where well, like I said, I, Mo and I were in the trenches together during the vaccine thing. So there was times where I remember sitting next to her, just like, oh, I can't do this. Like, because, you know, one organization was saying one thing, another organization was saying another, you know, Google was doing their own thing with, you know, like, and we couldn't figure out which one, you know, were we actually making progress or not towards these things. And, um, it was definitely a struggle. So that's the biggest lesson learned is I wish we could come together as a community and have some common language around that before we find the next pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. You're right. Most things are possible. <laughs> Mike, it looks like there was one other in the chat. Um, is there a way for you to share these uh, dashboards and reports? Um, I don't know. Mo, if you were putting links in the chat, it looks like so. I put the timeline link in the chat, or no, someone else did that way early. I I put the equity lens and the um the feedback form for the equity lens in the chat. Um, but you can look at the the timeline. I mean, it's better to do it online because every time we update it, the most updated one will be there. Um. Stephanie, I see there's a question about stakeholders <clears throat> in planning the dashboards. I am not a data person, so I'm gonna guess that you're talking about the timeline. Um, we connected a lot with the Lane Historical Society. So that's our local Lane County um, Museum. And they have folks who research all of the things. In fact, every time Every time we get a suggestion, I send it to them and say, is this, should we go down this rabbit hole? And they either say, yes, we should, or we did that once and never found anything else. Um, we also have talked with, oh my gosh, the, the um, Black Pioneers who are based out of, I think Pendleton. Um, we talked with the U of O Museum of Cultural History. So lots of <clears throat> historians. Um, we also, I'm connected. Um, so a smidge of background on me is I'm a biracial black person that was raised here in Eugene. And so I'm connected with a lot of the elders. And so um, just talking with them about their life and their experience and things that we should pay attention to. Um, and certainly it's not complete, so. All right, I think we're just about at time. We maybe can get one more question, but we could probably also stick around um, at the end if we have time after the other presentations as well. And so I believe we're handing it over to Idaho, Holly. Yeah, so uh, our next speaker is Robert Cabal from I uh, State of Idaho. So Robert, welcome and thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Okay. Yes, my name is Robert Cable. I am a data scientist in the state of Idaho. Agency Information Technology Services is where I am located. And I am on a small three person team. Uh, it's the data and analytics team. And we are tasked with employing modern technology and business solutions that will lead to better government. And this includes deploying an analytic system to promote evidence-based decision-making. And one part of this system is our Tableau servers. And so the question, I guess the comment came up several months ago, um, stating that there were some interests in understanding um, how states have been faring with Tableau premium support. And, so I said, yeah, we can share our experience, no problem. And hopefully this helps those who are interested and those who maybe didn't know they weren't interested. Uh, maybe it also helps you understand a little more about our system, what we're trying to do and how premium support has helped us. So to give a little bit of a context, 
to what we're doing. Our agency is in a period of growth where new infrastructure technologies are being adopted, customers are being onboarded, and internal resources are very stretched. So in order to expedite the process, uh, the DNA team, my team, took on the server deployment ourselves. And we did not have a lot of previous Tableau server experience. So right now our system is less than a year old, uh, about half a year. We have two core servers. Uh, one of them is an internal facing server and that is up and running. And the next one is an external facing server where we can get data and information out to the public. And that one is planned to be stood up hopefully this month. So we've started bringing on users from outside agencies and we don't have a massive production system yet, but we're hoping to reach that at some point soon. So a little bit about our experience with premium support. Uh, Tableau provides a typical support system with SLA case management where snapshots of messages or log files are submitted. And then the Tableau technical support or TAM representative is assigned or uh, sorry, the TS, the tech, Tableau technical support representative, not the TAM, I'll get to the TAM later. Um, I don't want to bore you with a lot of the details of how, you know, some of the issues we've had, but I, I can summarize by saying most of our tickets have been related to internal hardware and firewall issues. And the premium support crew has helped to save hours of troubleshooting for our team and other internal teams by identifying a specific resolution or a range of resolutions, which we can then implement internally. And so given our constraints and how stretched uh, every, every team is within our agency, this has worked quite well for us. So the second part of the premium support is the account care. And we've opted to hold weekly meetings with our with our techno account manager, this is the TAM. And this is where we've seen most of the benefit. Each meeting is fairly standard where we go over any cases that might be open, uh, any need to know announcements, upcoming maintenance releases. And then we cover any other resources that the TAM has found based on our ongoing conversations. And we can run questions past the TAM and review scenarios. And this has saved a lot of time on us, uh, or, for us as we you know, don't have to search through documentation and our system doesn't experience a lot of downtime because we can run scenarios up front. And so our TAM and solution engineer have also helped us to pivot several times from the original installation. So this included guidance for upgrading hardware. And then most recently after receiving much negative feedback internally from customers about an extra login step, uh, we're able to sync up our Azure AD for authentication. And again, the, uh, the TAM and the solution engineer has uh, been pivot, uh, crucial to us being able to pivot quickly uh, implementing these new, these new changes. Now, we have been pleased with the service. Uh, Tableau premium support has been a big part of our success and our TAM and solution engineer have been great to work with. Uh, the service has not been cheap, but we have experienced a good return on investment. And we continue to use the service, hopefully, as our system expands and uh, we can bring on the public. We can, we can uh, expand where we need to and get our uh, agencies and Idaho citizens up and going and more informed on what their government is doing. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing. So like I mentioned, I didn't want to bore anybody with the details of specific issues we've had. Um, I did just want to share the general experience and, and it has been positive. Uh, it has taken us from a point of not knowing anything about Tableau Server to up and running, and now we have customers in and, and doing what they do best, which is create data, share data, and get the word out as far as what their goals are. Now, that was uh, quite quick, and I, I kind of purposefully did that so we could maybe have some time for questions. Any, anyone want to know more 
about uh, our experience or maybe what you could expect if you choose to use premium support. Or even about what Idaho has been doing as we build our analytics platform. How are you prepping data for the server live connection to a data warehouse or extracts? It's a good question. And it really depends on the, the customer. Uh, we've come up with a standard method that we would prefer. And we are currently are using a data lake system called Snowflake. And so we can ETL or ELT the customer's data into Snowflake, get it formatted in a way that uh, serves the analytics purpose. And then we connect Tableau Server to that Snowflake uh, setup. And a lot of our connections are extracts, but we do have the data management add-on, which is a Tableau Server additional license. And that allows us to schedule uh, updates to extracts. So we don't have to rely on live links. Uh, did I understand that your three person team is supporting Tableau for the entire state? Okay. So we have several large agencies who already are fairly mature in their Tableau use. But yes, we there's only two servers in the state. One of these other large agencies has one and then our agency IITS uh, is setting it up so other agencies can begin taking advantage of it. So, yes. Would you, let's see, you said you have a public facing server. Could you explain a little more on how you are using this? Well, right now we're not using it. Uh, it's planned to be installed this month, but the idea will be to allow agencies and hopefully eventually counties to create dashboards, publish them to their to our external facing server, much like Tableau Public. And then those links can be embedded into you know, the agency's websites or they can post direct links, whatever they choose to do. And so it allows individual users within agencies to post their dashboards so the public can view them. Okay. You said you have a public facing server. Oh, I read that one. Are you deploying an HA setup? And if so, how many nodes are you using? So our, bu our budgets are severely constrained right now. Uh, so while we would like a high availability setup, uh, we're, we don't have one yet. Uh, now that will change as more agencies come on and as our analytics platform grows. Uh, our, hopefully our ability to pull in a larger budget will also grow. And at that point, we'll look into uh, putting in an HA system. And how many nodes are you using? Currently, uh, we have two servers each. Uh, oh, jumped around there, sorry. Okay. Uh, we do have a multi-node system uh, specifically to take take advantage of the data management portion of server. Uh, as the core IT team for the state, do you have any recommendations for other teams getting multiple agencies up and running on Tableau? Any lessons learned? So Tableau is only a small part of what we're trying to do, but to the point of the question, uh, we are also setting up a system where data literacy can grow throughout the state. And what that means is agencies may have information and that stops there. They know they have information. They know that they need to report it to maybe the legislature or a federal, uh, under a federal grant, but they may not understand the power of taking that data and using it for further analytics. And so what we're doing with agencies as we're, we're slowly bringing them on right now is we're working with them and saying, okay, now that we've discovered where your data is, eventually we're gonna bring a catalog system where we can also catalog it and help them to identify um, 
and share what data they do have. But for now, uh, we're kind of doing that on the side, uh, you know, through Excel and, and things like that. Uh, but we start there. Okay, what data do you have? And then we take them through the whole life cycle process all the way up to and including um, the destruction of the data. And so the, the data life cycle and the data literacy is our main focus. And Tableau, of course, helps us in this goal as we can um, show agencies, you know, through visualizations, uh, what they have and what they can use, uh, use the data for. Okay. What are the internet interface programs used with Tableau and which would be best given what the intent of the website is? Could you clarify that question for me? Okay. So currently, um, I, I suppose uh, out of the box, we don't need to rely on um, an internet interface program, if I'm understanding you correctly. Uh, we are standing up the servers, giving people access, and they're going to town. Okay, how many users do you currently have and are providing any training? Okay, how many users do we have? I think we're up to 40. I think we're up to 40. And um, right now we're at three agencies. When, as soon as our external comes up, we're going to expand that to 15 agencies. And then from there, we expect the floodgates to kind of open and and, and whoever wants to come in can come in. And how, let's see, second part of that, and have you provided any training? We have, we have provided training. So we actually, um, within our system, we provide, as far as visualization tools go, Tableau and Power BI. And so we've been able to do uh, lots of training on both those systems with uh, both users. And of course, when you say Tableau, um, and that you can get Tableau, uh, people get pretty excited because they see it everywhere. You know, it's, it's right now the uh, industry standard, one of the industry standard tools. And so um, we, we are doing a lot of training, yes. As you can imagine, uh, we're pretty busy with all, all that's going on. Uh, Tableau is not a web development tool. It needs to interface with the web using a programming language that connects the web with the Tableau data resources. Um, okay, so uh, maybe Laura can jump in on this one. Um, she's our solutions engineer, but basically we, we stand up the server and then people are able to access it through a basic browser. Um, and then the, the browser requirements are listed on the Tableau webpage, but Safari, Chrome, uh, Edge, you know, all the basic ones are, are able to be used to access the server. Yeah, it all. Uh, so, you know, there's different ways that you can have um, people on an external website access Tableau. Um, the first is Tableau Public, um, which was is more meant for people just sharing their own different types of um, more informal reports and, and dashboards. Um, we also have Tableau Server, which Robert's team has um, that they can um, have like a guest user access. Um, it's really depends where they want to set the server up. Um, it uh, is a more secure kind of authentication um, for them to have more automation, better data size limits um, than Tableau Public. Um, and they can just honestly embed those dashboards um, right into their publicly available website. So there's really not a lot of programming that Robert and his team have to do. Um, it kind of comes out of the box um, and is able to be embedded um, really easily. Hopefully that's helpful, Malcolm. And we and we also have, and I'll, I'll share this link later, but we have, um, if any of you have seen Tableau across America, um, it's where we've collected a lot of our um, external facing 
um, dashboards that um, our public sector customers have been developing a lot of those on Tableau server. Um, so you can actually see how they're embedding them into their websites, um, the different use cases they're using. So sometimes having that visual with how they're using it within their website is helpful. So I'll, I'll share that at the end of our uh, user group meeting as well. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Okay, good. So Malcolm says, yes, that did clarify. Great. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I, I hope this was helpful for you. And uh, now we'll move on to the next presenter. Robert, thank you so very much. And so our next presenters are going to be from Plant Moran, which is one of our premier partners that we work with very closely in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Stephanie and Mark, I'll turn it over to the both of you. Great, thank you, Holly. And great presentation so far. I'm Stephanie Henry, I'm a manager within the business analytics consulting practice at Plant Moran. Um, our leaders and uh, part of the leadership team for this tug moving forward. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you um, much better and learning how you're leveraging Tableau within your organization. Um, as Plant Moran, we've been a partner with Tableau for over many years, supporting such leader groups such as this. Um, I've been with the firm for over four years now, but I have over 19 years of experience in this data analytics space. I came from a large school district here in Colorado where I worked for nearly 16 years um, and getting Tableau server up and running and scaled out across the organization. Um, this will be my fourth user group that I facilitate. I also lead a state local government one here in Colorado. We support clients all over the country with leveraging their data, helping them stand up and create and implement business intelligence solutions from accessing the data process tools, developing roadmaps for success, um, which is one of the, the topic of the agenda today. I truly enjoy, enjoy helping our clients all over the country be successful in their data analytics journey. And I'm gonna hand it over uh, to the partner in crime today, uh, Mark Richards. <laughs> I've been called worse. Thank you, Stephanie. And good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Richards, and I'm a partner with Plant Moran, part of our analytics practice. And, and I basically, I help customers tell story through data. So that's from understanding and questioning how it's stored, how it moves, how it flows, the patterns involved, the shortcomings, the anomalies that exist, help customers strategize and implement all aspects of data. That's management, governance, quality, blending, automation, architecture, key metrics definition, implementation, reporting and visualization design. I've been doing this for almost 30 years, longer than I care to remember. Um, and I'm based out of Austin, Texas. Stephanie, I wonder if we can slide forward a little bit. And today we're gonna to talk to you guys about the concept of an analytics center of excellence because it's the backbone of a data-driven organization, but it's also a broad topic. So we're gonna break it down a little bit. It's, it's looking at data as an asset that provides strategic and competitive advantage. It's about ensuring you get everything you can out of that asset. And it's about aligning analytics with your culture, your mission and your goals. It's about identifying the right key metrics and managing the flow of data and providing the right information to the right people at the right time in the right way. It's about building and managing teams that are highly aligned with that goal. And this diagram is a high level look at some key concepts. So we're gonna rock around this clock a little bit and pick out a few key selectors uh, and indicators of success. So at three o'clock, you've got data governance, key to the success of any analytic strategy, but it often dies on the vine due to lack of buy-in, mostly because it can be very abstract. We look at how to take data governance from the academic to the operational, make it meaningful. Seven o'clock adoption, concept of hearts and minds. Taken as written that people generally don't like change. What are some of the strategies to achieve high levels of engagement and excitement amongst your users? How do you define your audiences? How do you identify and address the differing needs of each of these groups? Five o'clock process, segueing off both adoption and data governance. How do you establish the feedback loop to keep people engaged? How are you set up as a data-driven organization? Are you centrally controlled or do you operate more as a collaborative with super users in different divisions? What are the pros and cons of each? Nine o'clock, trends. Analytics doesn't make decisions, people do. But data gives us the context to make better decisions. Model it, modern visualization techniques bring patterns in your data to the fore and good data practices can establish the basis for taking things to the next level concepts like data science, like predictive analytics and machine learning. And finally, analytics is not just about flashy dashboards. For many of our customers, it's the simple act of getting information out. 
automating the blending and delivery of data from multiple systems, be it output to Excel or the latest whiz-bang Tableau viz. Neither is it solely the domain of big companies. Rather, it's a framework that can be adapted and applied to organizations of all sizes and complexities. And Stephanie, if you could move forward one more time, please. What you're looking at here is a four-step ACE methodology, our analytic center of excellence. Our methodology strikes a balance between planning and implementation. As you can see here, the first two phases are strategic and the last two are implementation. And the combination and interaction of both these facets are equally important when you look at that holistic journey. And the concept of the analytic center of excellence is an interesting one. It's genesis and evolution came from our combined experiences and established best practices, things we'd been doing individually with clients for many years, but collected together into a documented and battle-hardened methodology and roadmap. The key point of it all is that while analytics does not make decisions, as we've said, people do that, that innovative use of data provides you the ability to make those better decisions. And you often hear the saying, fail to plan, plan to fail. And there's certainly some truth in that, but if your strategy and planning stays at too high a level, so that it can't translate into action, you run the risk of inertia. On the other hand, going too deep can result in analysis paralysis when nothing ever gets done. And some concepts can be so abstract, they really have to be associated with a discernible operational need. So discover, plan, build, evolve. We're gonna walk through each of these four steps and here's Stephanie to talk about the first of those, discover. Thanks, Mark. The discover phase is focused on that reflection framed with the intention of, intention of striving for improvement. The goal of the discover phase is to have a solid understanding of the current processes, the desired future state, and acknowledgement of potential hurdles. If you don't know where you're coming from, how can you determine the path that will get you to where you want to be? So we have noted on this slide here a few items that we would be discover uh, should be included in your discovery process. Uh, show and tell, so right, like that's bringing a group together and looking at um, what they're using, understanding really where you wanna go, identifying those key metrics, art of the possible. There are several up here on the screen. Many of those activities within this discovery phase are around taking inventory of what you currently have. So again, on this slide here, we've identified a few areas that we like to really dive into with our clients, taking inventory on those strategic initiatives, right? So there's um, top level decisions that are being made. And if you're starting to roll out this data analytics program, there's gotta be some alignment uh, to have this be sustainable. So dive into those, figure out what's tied to this analytic center of excellence. You got to be sure that there's resources and funding that's going to support this work. Again, it has to be tied to that organizational initiative. Uh, when we work with our clients, we look at taking an inventory of their data sources. Um, it's interesting when you bring a group of people together and you start to find out all of the silo data that sits on desktops or shadow systems and a lot of times people don't know what their peers are kind of storing and where it's being stored. So pulling together graphic organizers and starting to note all of those, uh, where you're getting data from and where you're providing to, because oftentimes it's that, that two-way street. Um, looking at a similar process for the reports. So you receive reports from people, but then off, oftentimes your coworkers have to provide reports and starting just to track all of that down. Uh, this documentation is going to be imperative as you move through the future phases of this ACE methodology. You need to have that documentation and the governance has to be in place for all of those data and report flows. So reflection of that the governance um, has to be included with the, the way your team is thinking and, and planning forward. Uh, with the lens of the data analytics, um, you have to make sure that you have those roles and responsibilities clearly defined so that you know um, who's expected to do what, what expectations and hold people accountable for those as well. Those last few blocks up here on the screen are often overlooked. Um, it's really about that data literacy, which we've heard about earlier in presentations, um, the data culture, and then that communication. So reflecting on what that data culture looks like within your team and if data-driven decision-making is an expectation in your organization, um, think about um, 
Are you giving people the opportunity to learn and to properly leverage the data that you're collecting? Uh, the, that collection um, of information is, is so imperative in making sure you have that communication plan with how you're gonna disseminate all of this curated data and, and reports here. Um, one of my uh, favorite things that we do with customers is listening sessions. It's just an area that I love um, sitting and talking with people. Uh, so we facilitate conversations to explore the current and those desired states, which I just talked about on that last screen. So it's setting up formal meetings with groups of staff. We dive into how they use it. So it's really getting at the user, not just at kind of this higher team leadership level. Um, we want to make sure that we're hearing from staff uh, to find out if they're confident with the accuracy of their data, how much time they're spent stitching things manually. We quickly learn of process gaps, which could result in those silo data sets. Um, we also just need to find out with what tools they're using. Sometimes they'll go and purchase, you know, side tools because they aren't getting what they need from the organization. Sometimes tool sets are um, deployed in an organization, but those skill sets are missing, which I think Robert also talked about earlier today. All of our presentations are coming together here. Um, one of the favorite questions I love to ask my clients is, what would make your data analytic work more efficient? So often these conversations lead us to sketching out on, the, on a whiteboard together um, some of those dashboards where if we could build it once and have it be repeatable, right, then that's the power of Tableau. How do you can make it come to life, which alleviates some of their mundane tasks, which allows them to focus um, on, on other areas of their job. So I think it's very important um, that the decisions are not made in a silo because you can miss that mark when it comes to finding the solutions and improving processes. So collaboration uh, across the organization cannot be overestimated. So you have to work directly with those who are using the data and the reports to really uncover um, what is happening in there. So during the discovery phase, you've got to lean in and explore how you nurture that current data culture, set expectations, how it's being communicated, uh, and providing that professional growth amongst your team. And by the close of the discover phase, you are filled with background knowledge and big ideas uh, of what's gonna come in your data analytics journey. Um, and what you should account for. So I'm gonna hand it back over to, to Mark. All right, thanks, Stephanie. So yeah, so you're at a point now you've got a good feel for where you wanna go, but it could, be well, it could well be far away on that horizon. You've interviewed multiple groups. Maybe each group has their own goals and needs. How do you prioritize the different asks? Within Discover, we explored what and why. Now within planning, the focus shifts to address the question of how. It's the transition from talking about start and end points to planning the actual journey. Let's discuss in, in some case competing priorities you may have heard from discovery phase. Helping clients use decision trees to prioritize and timeline those needs is a central part of planning along with the concept of milestones. If the end goal is a long way away, you need some intermediate checkpoints to determine progress and success or otherwise. And part of that is chunking the work. You are not going to conquer the world in a day, rather you're going to take pieces of it at a time. And just as important in this phase is communication, both with the executive group and your data customers, understanding the different roles, audiences, and how to establish feedback loops, how to structure the communication of updates. It's important to retain and buy in from your constituents. Speaking of structures, this is the optimal time to get those foundations in place. Granted, they will evolve and they will change over time, uh, but getting your first swing at them should be done here working in collaboration with clients to talk about data governance, what it means to their organization, determine roles and accountabilities, putting names to those roles. It's a valuable exercise as you move into build and beyond. Let's talk about software and hardware needs. These are the vehicles of execution and should be discussed in terms of the needs and features that come to the fore in discovery. Your existing software inventory and skill sets of your team should be considered as to how they might work in tandem knowing that the software and those skills may or may not need to be supplemented. And finally, putting together a project plan for the first three to 12 months of the initiative helps to level set expectations, put some dependencies in play and create accountability and transparency all around. All right, back to Stephanie, let's get into build. All right, so following that project plan, we're gonna start building it out. Uh, we're going to include training, building data and reporting and that communication. It's where it's all of that hard work that you put into collecting information, planning it, and now you got to build it. So when an organization 
is new to data analytics, this building phase may include the training and mentoring around the data integration and the business intelligence software. So here, obviously, we're talking about Tableau. Uh, we coach our clients in developing that training plan and how to build up their staff skill. So before we talked about kind of leaning in and trying to figure out where those gaps may be, and so now it's how do you fill those? People coming brand new, people who have been using the tool but may just kind of need to be upskilled a bit. Um, so as you develop those learning plans, I would encourage you to consider that type of learner you have. There's the auditory, the visual, the reading, writing, and the kinesthetic. So do your, do your staff learn more efficiently with instructor-led sessions or self-paced? Do they learn better with hands-on activities, reading instructions, or watching videos? You're investing um, in their education and the upskilling in order to make this work in your organization. So you want to make sure that um, the investment you're placing into that, to your team members, to your employees that you value and, and want to hang on to, you want to make sure that it aligns with what they need um, to be the most successful. So, and also think about the time frame. So some staff may learn better in shorter segments and others just may require um, longer time durations where they can really spend time in and focused. So lately you've been hurt likely hearing that terminology gamify your learning. So at a really high level, it just means that you are, um, that your learners are going to be more successful if you incentivize and offer praise and rewards. Sometimes you hear badges or call outs for the completion. So I just really encourage you to think about that with your staff. Think about it, you know, from their lens, like what's in it for them? Why, why do they need to learn this? And how is that going to improve uh, the work environment? Uh, okay, so once your staff has been trained up, you're going to begin executing um, on the, the data architecture aspect of it, and then also the reporting architecture. So this could include connecting to those data sources, developing, you know, data models, developing the actual architecture. So that's like the technical aspect of it from the server. What's that going to look like to stand up that server? Um, the governance needs to be applied to make sure making sure that you're following that governance that you laid out the plan for, uh, security and access is set properly, that your documentation, um, all of these uh, points of creation um, and setup and governance. Um, if you've already set up that the Tableau server, we recommend going back and doing a health check because if it was installed or set up a while ago, um, you wanna make sure that it's still aligned with what, you know, the current lens and the current governance um, that you're wanting to kind of see out um, with this kind of re-engagement. Um, you should also make sure um, that just even the folder structures and security and groups just make sense with how you're going to keep scaling out. So when you think about the roadmap and timelines, uh, you might need to decide that you have, out, you, there's a gap and you need outside resources for support for that rapid development. So we often help our clients collaborate um, and get them upskilled quickly, develop the, help them develop their data and reporting architectures and apply those best practices. And then we do a transfer of knowledge session to teach them how to continue uh, to, to maintain or to upkeep. So sometimes it's just helpful to have someone come in here and, and get you up and running um, faster. So this is a reporting life cycle that I like to use um, as you move kind of upper, upper left and kind of zigzag your way down. You're going to have a, a, a report request come in. It needs to be approved. Um, you're going to need to do that re uh, requirement gathering. Um, you need to talk with those stakeholders. You'll host a design session where you really spend time thinking about uh, the requirements that you've you know, identified. Think about the end user experience. What filters do they need? What additional context they need to have to be successful with looking at that report? Um, once you have that design in place, you're gonna do that data modeling. So making sure that you have the data pulled in, that you've clearly identified whether it's an extract or live, what securities, are there any query level filters that are sitting on that, um, then you're going to develop it. And so because you've done that legwork up front, those four steps, your development's going to go much quicker and it will be a much more efficient process. There's not gonna be a lot of rework. You have brought the stakeholders together, you've clearly outlined what you need, you have that sketch, from tooltip to filter to layout to color palette, everything's already been predefined so that when the developer sits down and opens up Tableau Desktop or they're building a web authoring tool online, it's gonna to be very rapid. 
um, because it's already kind of been a blessed and approved. Um, but you're still going to test it, circle back to those stakeholders, making sure the report meets what they need, might do a couple edits, some small tweaks, verify you know your data is still accurate, then you're going to deploy it. You're going to follow that communication plan with you've great you've created great content. So now how do you how do you advertise it? How do you let people know uh, to come and explore it? And then monitor. You're going to want to make sure that you're checking in. If people are not using it expected, reach out. Like why why are you not connecting to this? Do you not know it's available? Uh, maybe they don't understand how to use it. For those who use it um, frequently, it's always good to reach out with them as well and find out from them, you know, what, why do you love this so much? What are, what are some of the key aspects so that you can take away those pieces and incorporate them into the next dashboard uh, that you have out here? Oops, I went the wrong direction. I'm going to hand it back over to Mark. All right, thanks, Stephanie. I'll cover Evolve really quickly here. Uh, by this point, we've got something to show, something really good, and people are going to want more. Evolve is about taking the success and excitement of that initial build and building out the infrastructure to help it grow and mature. It's about building a data community and increasing the user base and being responsive to their needs. Planning several cycles in advance, it's about growing the team to meet the increased demand and staying in front of user needs by means of good practice, structure, and communication. And it's about ensuring the system is architected for growth and expansion. Stephanie, bring us home. All right, so to summarize all of this, the data underlines everything that we're doing from capturing it to securing it to extracting blending and then reporting on it within Tableau. While the transformations might be accomplished by the data and visualization tools, it's the journey itself that is planned and managed by the process you put around it. It's about identifying the right key metrics, managing the flow of data, providing the right information to the right people at the right time in the right way. It's about building and managing those teams to make sure they're highly aligned with the goal. The methodology that we have just discussed over the last few minutes um, is how we manage that journey with our clients. So those concepts and principles um, behind this are universal. And so we, we strongly believe that having that analytic center of excellence, which is very much aligned to the Tableau blueprint, ensures that your organization is well prepared to excel in your data and analytics journey. So. I have our contact information up here. We love to chat. Um, so email us, uh, call us, and we would love to just talk about your journey, um, listen and share ideas. It's one of the, the great things we love. Um, so I'm gonna pull up some questions. We have a few minutes um, on our time slot here. Um, how do you inventory data sources within Tableau server across multiple sites for ACE? So I think, that um, obviously there's the, da the data and management add-on, which I think Laura can probably help talk through as well, um, is a great way to kind of pull that up. Many of our clients have different ways of documenting that. Um, sometimes it's, it's just a matter of right, um, very basic Excel spreadsheet or screenshots. Um, using the, the data cataloging tool, obviously within Tableau, it's very much about um, creating a system that you know you can maintain. So to create it once, but have it be too cumbersome, you'll never uh, go back and make those edit and tweaks. So I think it's um, leveraging tools that you already have in your organization because you're used to going down that path, I think is very important. Um, let's see here, there's, I'm gonna pull this over so I'm not looking at a different screen here. Um, looks like we have Zen Master's Guide, user groups, data glossary and data dictionary implementation. Mark, I'll have you answer this when you spend a lot of time helping customers kind of craft that out. I know I have my own field mapping Excel spreadsheet that I use. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll no, absolutely. And you know, there are, there are, there are tools that are, you know, geared toward, um, you know, data dictionaries and catalogs and things like that. But uh, I mean, as Stephanie said, I mean, you know, it, it's a matter of documenting it's a matter of making it operational. Um, and, and, you know, we often see different interpretations of data fields across different users, which means that, ev you know, everybody who's using the visualization, maybe not, not be using it in the correct way or not be quite cognizant as to what it means. So I, I, I'm a big believer in, in data dictionaries and, and data glossaries, and I'm actually a big believer in making them operational and making those definitions available, um, you know, within the actual reports themselves and that, that we work a lot with 
uh, our, our customers and our clients on that. And I, and I think, you know, and several of the comments that we've had here, including cataloging, you know, data sources, it's about gatekeeping. And, and it, it, it's, a, it's, it's part process, but it's a big part of data governance. Um, and it's, it's, it's identifying the, the, the owners of that data um, and having the proper definitions, the technical definition, the business definition, um, and having that, that owned by the correct people in the organization so everybody is, is singing from the same hymn sheet. I'll let Laura answer that in a second. I'm going to just chime in. When we think about those data definitions and you think about it in the context of Tableau, um, oftentimes we see our customers use um, an Excel spreadsheet similar to our first presentation where they had the timeline. If you were to have that data dictionary in there and then you join it or have that relationship within Tableau, you can actually leverage those definitions and tooltips. Um, so when you hover over a field, you could have that definition pop up. So I've seen that very recently when working with a, a client. We've also leveraged um, the show hide containers. So if you wanted to have um, a pop up container or if they were to click on that and you could insert some definitions there or to who to uh, contact for questions or clarification of who the data steward is for that data set. A lot of ways to kind of work that in for that user experience. And then the final one that comes to mind is having an additional dashboard within your workbook that is a resource tab. You're able to bring in those data definitions. And again, rather than hand type them in Tableau, that's leverage an Excel spreadsheet um, and, and bring that into the data set so it is there as well. Um, so Laura, I, I know we're just a minute over, but if you want to chime in with the data management tool, just so we're kind of giving uh, that to credit as well. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much. I, I think you guys also just presented some great solutions people can use right now. And it leads into a great segue into our data management add-on, which also has some different types of solutions you can um, use and make available to um, your Tableau users. So with that, I'm going to get started. Everyone can see my screen. Um, so thank you guys uh, for joining. I'm Laura LeBeau and I'm a solution engineer here at Tableau. Um, as a solution engineer, I'm really a technical counterpart to my sales execs. So I'm here to help talk more about technical questions that pop up along the way and make sure our customers are getting the best use out of their Tableau experience. Um, and, and currently here at Tableau, I support the Pacific Northwest as well as Idaho and Montana. So um, all of you on the, on the call, um, I support in some way or another. Um, I just wanted to also mention, thank you guys for being Tableau customers and giving us the opportunity at the end of this user group to show how we're continuing to innovate the Tableau platform. Today, we're gonna to be covering um, you know, the latest and greatest that our Tableau data management tool has to offer. We're gonna um, cover the prep conductor, Tableau catalog, um, and then recently just added in 2021.4, so at the end of last year, virtual connections and data policies, which have been really giving enhanced um, data security and governance. We'll also just take a quick look and I'll show you guys where you can find some of the new features um, that have just come out um, within the last uh, week or so with 2022.1. So data-driven organizations are able to get a better picture of what's going on, make smarter decisions faster, and help everyone be aligned in making decisions on data and not their opinions. Today, being data-driven is not just a matter of competitive advantage, it's really a matter of survival. So in order to drive success and adoption, companies need to build a really good data culture. Some of the foundations of a good data culture are having number one, good data access, number two, easy preparation of data, and three, a clear governance to enable some self-service analytics. Tableau has seen two major trends. Um, the first on the left side being a change in data and the second being a change in people. On the data side, we're seeing a lot more data. This isn't new, but it continues to be a fact. What's more interesting is we're seeing more diverse data, um, whether it's enterprise data, departmental data, or personal data. Third, as we're seeing data explode, we're also seeing organizations moving away from trying to centralize it all in one place. They're not necessarily all just trying to put it in one data warehouse or even maybe a few. Instead, they want to just be able to connect to the data wherever it resides. 
On the other side, we see people. Um, we see that analytics is no longer a nice to have or something that only some teams need to use. Rather, it's becoming expected across all teams. More people need to be able to use data to do their job so they can make good decisions. We're also seeing people having more access to data so that they can do some of this analysis on their own. The tools we give business users, the ability to prepare and govern their data were built for IT. Um, they're great and powerful tools, but they also have a steep learning curve and are not the most intuitive to navigate. Think about a scenario. You have IT or the dashboard builders investing hundreds of hours building and documenting all of these really good rich data environments, but then controlling the access to the data. There needs to be some level of a self-service world now, um, which is very different. It leaves someone with a data question with one of two paths. Um, they either don't have the right access to these IT systems, or if they do, they're worried something they uh, might break uh, if they try to change it. Um, or as some of you guys might see in your own organizations, um, these business users end up dumping all of that uh, data into Excel and create this ungoverned chaos. Um, IT then loses a lot of visibility into how their data is being used. This is a huge loss because the think, all of the thinking and valuable inputs that the business is doing, like combining data sets, defining KPIs, and identifying filters, um, just gets, it, it's disappeared. Um, so it kind of erodes a level of trust between business and IT. So how do we really bridge that gap between business users creating their own content and IT struggling to understand what the business needs? With Tableau starting to lower the barrier for business users to explore data, play with data, we started to see a new pattern emerge. Um, business users could come up with some of those views they needed on their own, and IT could look at what they did and understand what was needed to support that analysis from a technical perspective. So this is where Tableau data management comes into play. When we saw that we could leverage all the work that end users did and allow IT and data engineers to build upon that, they can then share new data definitions with business users and create a bridge between those audiences, creating greater value. So very specifically, you may be wondering, you know, what, what does the data management add-on do and how does Tableau address what we've been seeing with data-driven companies? It's Tableau's new tools for governing, auditing, and indexing your data within the Tableau server. Um, it's where users can go to look through published data easily and find what they need. It's where your admins can also easily review what's out there and take the right actions to drive efficiencies and improve the quality of your data practice. There's three main features that we have included today. The first is preparing and automating your data with Prep Conductor, then building in your data and building trust within your data with the Tableau catalog. And third, and this is a um, more new recent feature, uh, data security. So if you're a creator in Tableau, you already have access to Tableau's prep builder. This is a tool we've designed to make preparing your data easy and intuitive. Um, you use Tableau prep builder to combine, shape, and clean your data for better analysis in Tableau. Here's just a screenshot of what Tableau Prep Builder looks like. You have the flows at the top, and then you're able to actually see changes within the data. So if you want to edit a value, you can select right in there and directly edit it. You can change join types and see the results right away. So with each action, you're seeing those changes, even on millions of rows of data. So this is um, Prep Builder. Um, now with Prep Conductor, and Robert actually mentioned that his team had been using this to um, operationalize and automate some of that ETL flow. Um, you can easily publish and run flows in your server environment with the, the prep conductor add-on. So you're able to share those data sources securely using Tableau server or Tableau online. Um, and you're creating an environment where everyone in your organization can work with the most prepared and up-to-date data. So you can do some of the scheduling of the flows, running whenever you need them to, day or night. Um, that's like extracts. You can also automate those data prep processes, um, and it's will all just be you know ready for that analysis. You can also be monitoring those flows that you're setting up. Um, there's different admin views and run histories, um, so you know across the whole server you can address any issues quickly and know if your flows are healthy and have proactive alerts associated with them too. And then ultimately you can optimize some of that. So you can separate out your traffic and consolidate any redundant jobs that are extracting over and over and scale heavy loads on the system. This is just a quick view of what 
the uh, conductor looks like in Tableau. So you have you see Tableau prep that you can build down here separately, and then you're actually creating different jobs to run those, manage, um, look at history. Now, um, data catalog, and I'm glad that this got brought up um, because I think it's a really important part of our data management tool. Um, you know, why would someone need the Tableau catalog? Um, data is continuing to increase in volume, formats, and importance, which leads to more complex environments. It can be really hard to keep track of all of that data and how it's being used. At the same time, we have more users needing more access to more of that data in more places. And it's really difficult for users to find the right data. This can cause a lack of trust in the data because people are questioning whether they're using the right source or if it's up to date. With features that we have, such as lineage, impact analysis, uh, data dictionary, and a meta metadata API, Tableau Catalog does more than just like a traditional enterprise data, uh, data catalog. We focus on both the IT and the end user perspective. So everyone using Tableau has more visibility and trust into, into the data and allows for more discoverability on the, the end user side. So if you take a look right here, this is actually just showing the lineage. Um, it's showing exactly how the data moves. So if you're um, in a workbook, and I'll show you guys uh, this live, but if you're in a workbook, you can see um, what data sources are connected all the way down through every single visualization that's connected to um, you know, a data warehouse or an Excel extract. Um, you know, We can see if that information was transformed and how many people are also accessing and using it. Um, and this is important because you can do impact analysis there too. So if you make changes to the data, you know exactly what's affected um, downstream. So you know who will be impacted as well, who is accessing that, and then you can actually connect with them rather than having to track this information down manually. Um, you know, at the same time, um, from the IT perspective, we enable IT to communicate with their users. So say there's you know some impact, um, data is either sensitive or stale or something has happened to the data source, um, data quality warnings can actually be generated um, and uh, different data sources can be certified to define a single source of truth. Means everyone can ultimately be confident with the decisions they're making based on the data available to them. Um, and so this you see to the right is our data details pane. Um, and this really empowers our business users with understanding and transparency in their data. This catalog comes to them integrated directly into the dashboard they're consuming. How many times has a business user looked at a dashboard and asked, you know, what's the definition of those fields or what does it mean? Am I using the right thing? And the best response is, you know, go to your wiki or there's a spreadsheet that's being maintained in SharePoint. Um, you know, you can imagine that there's a lot of lost hours or just incorrect decisions being made because of a lack of understanding or time that someone has. So, you know, we with the, the add-on tool are trying to enable your organization to put all of this really rich metadata into the context of where your users are, which is already within the Tableau environment. Now I'm going to take a quick look and show you guys what this actually looks like. You see this data details here um, at the top of the screen. Um, all of your users will have access to this. This is just, you know, a normal dashboard. And you see to the right, this data details is what shows up. Um, you're, you're able to see views of the dashboard, um, who owns it, data sources that it's connected to. And then you're also able to see every field that's being pulled into use for this dashboard. Um, so for example, we have at risk. Um, you can actually click, um, you know, what does at risk mean? Um, I know you could also put some of this information in tooltips, but here's an actual, you know, the actual calculation of what at risk means. And, you know, if you wanna go replicate that somewhere, you have this information right here next to you. You can also click view more. And um, there's a lot more information about this field that you can look at as well as every single other field um, within this workbook. And right here, I actually don't have any descriptions updated, but this is where you can do that data dictionary. And you can either um, with our metadata API, link it to an existing, you know, if you're using Calibra um, or another, uh, you know, enterprise level data dictionary, you can connect it and have it flow through here, or you can be doing this within Tableau. Um, but this just gives your uh, users um, a lot more information 
Of course, this is a more central place for it, but as they're actually using those fields, they're able to just pull up information right here and better understand what they're looking at and you know how to use that information on new dashboards as well. And here's just an example of the lineage as well over here to the right. So, you know, we're seeing this embedded data source. We can see which sheets are associated to that. So again, maybe there's like PHI in here that we don't want everyone to see. We can see, hey, we need to remove it from all of these workbooks um, or specifically all of these dashboards. Um, and then, you know, we can contact this very specific owner um, to make sure that, you know, they're, they're in the loop on everything. So using prep catalog and some of those data details, we've created a completely new user experience. You know, we can prep makes the process of creating data sources easy, along with automatically collecting the metadata for catalog. Catalog makes it easy to find your data fast for consumption and auditing purposes. And then those data verification details build trust for your end users. Now, just really quickly, um, I know I only have a couple minutes left, but I want to touch on the new governance and security piece um, that we've introduced and we're continuing to enhance. And that starts with virtual connections and um, leads into centralized row level security, which I know is a mouthful. Um, but, um, you know, what is a virtual connection? It's a new content type in Tableau. Um, for example, um, say I have a database that I want to make available for my team to build dashboards before VCONs, virtual connections. Um, I could either give them username, password of the entire database, which gives them flexibility, but no standardization on my side. Um, and each connection is independent. Or I could give them a published data source, which gives standardization on my side, but they don't have any flexibility. So virtual connections, you see, kind of sits right up here. Oops, right at the top um, above those data, uh, published data sources and workbooks. Um, and it's like one central place that everyone can go to um, extract or refresh the data um, and, and just sit as a layer between the database. So centralized row level security, you know, what is row level security? That is something that we can do today in Tableau um, before having centralized row level security. Uh, for example, if we have a dashboard um, of the entire United States, but I'm the regional um, of the West, uh, regional manager of the West, um, you know, my superiors just want me to be able to see the West data um, with row level security. Um, I would be able to pull up the same dashboard everyone else is looking at, but just my West information would come up. Um, now um, in Tableau, we've created data policies. So you have the centralized area to define what users at a table level should have access to what data. We've created this GUI interface. It's really great. It um, helps us manage those data policies and um, enables us to scale um, so that you know, we can have more users using the same dashboards with the appropriate level of data. This way, um, you know, we can apply row level security at a table le level. It's able to flow down to everything downstream of it and provide that centralized monitoring and implementation point for your row level uh, policies and securities. Um, now, some of you may do this in your uh, database upstream of Tableau, so it's not you know, as applicable to you. And some of you may not even have a, a use case where you need to restrict data like that. But for those who do, um, this should really speak to you. Um, it should make uh, you know, understanding how to scale and have your data in the most secure, um, accessible way for all of your users um, much easier. I know I only have two minutes left. Um, I have, I'll just send this link out to you all. It is just showing the new features that we just had available in 2022.1. Um, my personal favorite is our workbook optimizer. You can have people who are creating workbooks run this. Um, it's great, makes things more efficient. Um, and with that, I, I know we have one minute left. Sorry, Holly, I didn't leave you a ton of time. Um, and I'll try to take a look at questions and, and get back in some emails as well. So Laura, um, you do have a couple of questions in the chat. So if I could okay. ask you to just go ahead and view those uh, and we'll get, uh, get those addressed. Yes, um, I'm creating an HR dashboard. Could someone send the link? I think I'll get back to that one. Screen readers don't read text fields or tooltips in Tableau. Any recommendations? Um, 
Yeah, so we do, I do have Melanie some additional information on Tableau accessi accessibility. I know tooltips is an area that we um, aren't, is not currently accessible. Um, we, I have a really good Tableau community on um, accessibility resources. So I'm gonna send that out to you because that's a, a really big topic. Um, but no, we have an entire accessibility team um, dedicated to every year trying to make things more and more accessible for all of our users. Um, the data details do not show up in Tableau Public. So this is actually um, specific to Tableau Server. Um, and, and so you would need to have like a licensed user that would be able to see data details um, and, and other things that came along with the data management add-on. And Amr, I appreciate some of the resources that you um, shared here. What version is virtual connections available? Correct, it is available in 2021.4. Brand new to 2021.4. Um, Amber, I can also um, answer any additional questions um, offline with you as well, because it's a, it's a really cool new um, data type or content type. Any last questions? Otherwise I know we're at time. Well, Laura, all right. thank, thank you all, yeah. yeah. Laura, thank you so very much. And team, um, if you are interested in learning a bit more um, about the new feature functionalities, uh, please reach out to myself and we'll get a call scheduled with Laura. But to all our presenters today, thank you all so very much for your participation. Again, moving forward, uh, we'll be passing this on to uh, Micah and to Stephanie to manage. So there will be some communication going out in regards to what other topics you would like to hear from. Again, we are looking for participants. Um, it's not a, it's not a, you know, a lot of time that we are asking, um, but uh, you know, your feedback is important. So if you are interested in participating in that committee, um, again, just please reach out and uh, we'll get you connected with uh, Stephanie and with Micah. So with that, um, thank you all. Have a wonderful day and uh, go data. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye bye.